Hello and welcome to our sixth and final webinar in the Person-Centred Care in Practice series. My name is Anna Flynn and I work at the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Now, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting today. For me, that is Gadigal land and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement and respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. As I said, we've come to the last webinar in this series. We really hope you've enjoyed them. If you've missed any or you want to watch them again, they're all available on our website. And we hope to bring you a second series soon. So please send us your ideas for topics, initiatives, or any presenters that you can recommend. And we've also recently released the second edition of our Person-Centered Care Insights, packed with great content that we've received from you, our network members. So thanks to everyone that's contributed and we're already working on the next issue. So please keep sending us your stories. And don't forget our resource hub. That's where you can find all things Person-Centered Care including information about our network, recordings of the previous webinars, some case studies, and also some tools that you can use to evaluate the delivery of person-centered care in your service. So just a bit of housekeeping before I introduce our guest speakers today. After the presentation, there'll be a live Q&A. So please type your questions in the Q&A function. Also, at the end of the webinar, you'll be sent a short survey. And as always, we'd really appreciate your feedback. So in today's webinar, we're going to shift the focus a little and have a look at how person-centred care is being addressed in primary health care. We're going to hear from Mike Vassell, CEO of Brisbane South Primary Health Network. Also, Angela Howe, Manager, Evidence Translation and Innovation. And they're joined by Dr. Johanna Lynch, who's a GP and psychotherapist and Senior Lecturer at the University of Queensland. And we'll also hear from Dr. Paresh Dorda, Principal GP at Next Practice in Canberra, and he's also a consultant and subject matter expert for person-centred care programs. And then for the live Q&A, we'll be joined by Nicole Forrester, who's Quality Improvement Coordinator at Brisbane PHN. So, without further ado, I'll hand you over to Mike Bussell. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mike Bazell. Uh, I am the CEO of Brisbane South PHN, and I'd like to thank you all for sparing the time to view this presentation. Before I start, can I just acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we're all working and living on, and of the many different nations across our wider country. Uh, can we also pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging as the holders of the memories, the traditions and spiritual well-being of all First Nations peoples? And can we acknowledge today any sorry business that may be affecting the community as a whole? In the spirit of reconciliation, partnership and mutual respect, can I reconfirm our commitment to working with all First Nations peoples to hopefully shape a health system that responds to both the needs and aspirations of all of our communities? In 2015, the Australian government established 31 PHN areas, 29 PHN organisations, which was the latest iteration of the Medicare uh, and therefore divisions of practice previously. And the whole ethos behind the PHN program was to deliver safe, sustainable, integrated primary care to all Australian people. PHNs are not providers of direct services. Rather, we commission those providers that we need to deliver the health and wellbeing programs targeted to all of our local needs and populations. Um, a little bit about Brisbane South PHN. Our vision is that we will provide the best possible health and well-being for every person in Brisbane. Uh, in essence, better systems means better health. We have a very clear person-centered approach and we value our inclusive culture that embraces the diversity that our region has, the service providers, the community and role models. Building a safe and equitable health system for all is the core of our business. A little bit about our region. Um, we're highly diverse. We're home to approximately about 1.2 million people, Queenslanders. Incidentally, we may be home to 1.2, but our GP practices services about 1.3 to 1.4 million people. So we see people from other PHN areas coming into our locality. That effectively is about 24% of the population of Queensland. 
Incidentally, we have the highest number of urban First Nations peoples of anywhere in the country, and our population is about just under 3% of all of our population identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. 31% um, of our population were born overseas, 20% of those in countries which were not English speaking. And our area, our region is the highest um, settlement target repopulation for Queensland. In terms of GP practices, we have just over 330, just over 2,000 medical practitioners. So we're a fairly large community of primary care. As a focused commissioning organization, uh, we try to address the needs of our population through a promoted and coordinated health approach. Taking a person-centered approach means that it's co-designing of services with our providers that puts the comprehensive needs of our peoples and our communities first, not only just their chronic illnesses or diseases. And it's those comprehensive needs of our people and communities that is, is at the center of our health system. It is our engagement and empowering our communities and our people to have a more active voice or role in their own health. And it also means that we have a basis to provide equitable health care for all. That means that our most vulnerable populations have access to the health care they need at the time they need and without little cost to themselves. As you can see, this is all summed up in that quintuple aim. And by having that focused person-centered approach, you start to see it actually permeating out. An equity approach means that we have an improved experience of care improved health outcomes for our populations. It does mean that the health system sees an improved cost efficiency and sustainability. And more importantly for us, because we are commissioners, is an improved provider experience. I think that's a great segue to hand over to Dr. Paresh, who will now speak to you about our person-centered care and how it promotes higher performing primary care. I was delighted to be involved um, with the PHN around uh, person-centered care and, and looking at high-performing general practice, very much as a consultant and subject matter expert. The whole initiative was very much based on an evidence-based model uh, of high-performing primary care um, on 10 building blocks. Um, and the 10 building blocks are shown on this slide. Um, the building blocks do take a stepwise approach um, and the foundational building blocks start with engaged leadership. And, and that was really a critical, important part of, um, of this program, of this initiative. Um, you know, these building blocks provide a framework uh, really to drive improvement in general practice um, around a vision um, that's very much focused on the consumer, focus on the patient. Um, and um, in, in doing so, um, it takes a very structured, systematic approach, uh, which is um, a prerequisite for which is um, an, a, a, an engaged leadership um, to provide vision, to provide direction, but then um, you, using data, using a team to really build that patient team partnership um, in an authentic person-centered way. When we're looking at this, um, there's a number of attributes that really make up high-performing primary healthcare. Um, and, and it's really bringing all these attributes together in, in a model of care, in a way of working um, that helps us to work towards that person-centered care. I, I guess this kind of starts with what do we mean by person-centered? And the concept of person-centered is very much around individualized care, um, care that's comprehensive and, and coordinated, um, care that's enabling um, and provided in a respectful way. Um, so it really concentrates on the relational aspects of, of care. Of course, having that model of care, it's, it's no use unless that care is accessible. So accessibility, responsiveness um, in, in the service is um, critical. And, and then, you know, providing care that is high, safe, high quality and accountable and transparent. Um, together, these attributes come, come together really to define um, 
what high performing primary care looks like. The value of this is quite broad. Of course, this value of providing a, a person centered model of care um, to the self, to, to the um, individual's concern, but actually this value to the service, um, to the medical practice, to the general practice that may be involved in provision of that care, um, it goes beyond the general practice. So it, it cuts across the sector, the primary care sector. And if we get the whole of the primary care system working in this way, we get a transformational change um, not only do we get that transformational change at the sector level, but it filters up to the system level, and then we get the societal benefits when we do that. So in, in summary, you know, the evidence-based use for this initiative was very much founded on the 10 building blocks, driven particularly by an engaged leadership, uh, working towards delivering high-performing primary care, uh, with benefits across um, the, the, the community. And with that, I'd uh, really like to hand over to Dr. Joanna Lynch, who's a GP with very much an interest in whole person care, who participated on this program uh, and, and the coaching. And so thank you, Joanna, and over to you. Thank you, Paresh. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you. I am a GP of 25 years from Brisbane who has lived out most of my working life in two suburbs that were close enough for one of my more severely traumatized and isolated patients to feel confident to drive to see me. I've actually made career choices around her confidence to drive. This patient also inspired innovation in my practice as I set up a transdisciplinary place in the hopes that she might accept referrals to other clinicians in the same building, and she did. In a system that privileges clinicians who do short appointments, I chose to do long appointments. In a system that might see GPs as merely providers of diagnosis, referral and care coordination, I undertook further training and responded to the need for trauma-informed care in my community. Integrate Place ran out of a low key house with almost no signage, so my patients would not feel too shy to come. It was a new way of offering care that was endorsed by the National Survivor Organization, now known as Blue Knot Foundation, and by the Division of General Practice at the time. It included a mental health nurse, social workers, an art therapist, and even a music therapist for a short time. We opened the clinic for a morning tea monthly, and the same patient who was socially isolated and couldn't drive far started coming to it. At first, she described being too scared to drink tea because of her shakes, and towards the end, she had the key and opened the clinic ready to host others. Most of the changes in her life would be invisible on current symptom-based outcome measures. Despite staff and patients loving the model, I really had to close in 2013 because I couldn't fund that kind of team for that sector of patients under the current Medicare fee for service system. I then went back to research what good quality mental health assessment is in primary care. I think I have innovated through research and writing as my way of responding to the traumatic life stories of my patients. I researched to try to understand and to try to transform the system. Many of my patients had had experiences in the healthcare system that re-traumatized them and often completely ignored their life experiences. So my PhD focused on exploring whole person approaches to distress in primary care. I realized that much of modern evidence about the impact of life story, relationships, meaning and context on health had not been integrated into any of the training I had received. I learned from the latest science and how the body responds to life stressors and how much it needs human connectedness. It made me passionate about seeing the whole person within their community and country. I began to see how First Nations approaches to the whole person can help us to see the many complex interactions that are part of health. If we think of a person as like a tree, we can be reminded how interconnected we are and how much of what makes us human is not easily measurable. Humans, like trees, have roots in the earth of their environment, culture, history and relationships. They also have leaves that are visible and easy to measure and categorize in healthcare. 
And between the roots and the leaves, there are invisible systems within the trunk that include things like our immune system, stress response hormones, our spirit, sensations, perceptions, strength, sense of self and experiences. I often teach GPs that they need, need to become tree huggers, caring for what is unseen inside the trunk. I chose to study one of these processes, the experience of sense of safety, a strength-based trauma responsive and recovery oriented approach to human distress that could be a shared language across the disciplines. Noticing these whole person processes that flow like sap to connect both the social sciences, relational and meaning-making knowledge of the roots and the biomedical observed precise and predictive forms of knowing of the leaves could be a way forward in healthcare. At times, those working with the leaves or roots can't see each other or respect each other's different forms of knowledge and different priorities. I think the story of the SAP can help us to transcend differences and bring the different disciplines together around shared priorities of safety for the whole person. My research has therefore worked to identify processes that might be relevant to health in, of the whole person. I began to search to understand and include anything that threatened or stressed a person. I asked patients and clinicians and Indigenous academics, what causes threat and how do you sense that you're safe? And what does the phrase sense of safety mean to you? What came out of that time was a beautiful picture of how threat impacts people in their environment. Many people mentioned injustice and racism, for example, as well as financial and housing concerns. It impacts our relationships, in our personal relationships and in the wider community where we live, learn and work. And it impacts our inner worlds, including our sense of self, inner experiences and meaning or spirit. This has become my way of tuning into the whole person. And this is what I now teach first year medical students and GPs and other mental health clinicians. It was in this context that I signed up for the coaching sessions with the person-centered team at the Brisbane South PHN. I was so glad to be able to talk to other innovative GPs who had transformed their practice and who wanted to respond to the need in their community and who built their practice around values that included equity. It was such a relief to speak to others who were trying to solve the big picture practical blocks to patient care and quality outcomes. It was also a relief to speak to someone who highly valued what practitioners experienced. I actually found myself near to tears meeting a fellow GP who cared about transforming the system that wasn't working for me or my patients. I found myself wanting to speak alongside them about the needs for changes in how we think about people within the consulting room that helps us to see the whole person, not just a diagnostic fragment. I also found myself a bit despondent as I still felt my patient caseload, a group of highly traumatized people, may still be left behind as they find it so difficult to advocate for themselves. I also suddenly felt sad for myself. In the compassionate care of the coach, I could see that he could see the sacrifices I had made to be able to serve this community. He knew very well what the decision to only do long appointments meant in terms of my own income, and he knew the impact of caring for this group of patients on my personal well-being. Seeing myself reflected in his eyes made me aware of my own needs. It made me feel exploited by a system that didn't seem to value either my own or my patients' needs. In fact, in my last session with the coach, I mentioned to him that I felt that perhaps I needed to stop doing this kind of work. This decision was multifactorial, including some post-COVID illness, but the person-centered coaching fundamentally made me aware of my own personhood and facilitated a transition towards teaching others about whole person care and continuing to try to innovate for transformation through writing, research and training GPs in the sense of safety as a whole person approach to well-being. This decision included grief and tears, standing in the car park, saying goodbye to that same patient who I had cared for now for 25 years as she drove away. In summing up, I would really like to thank the team for their work to transform care for our patients and clinicians sake. And I'd like to hold towards you both the personhood of the clinician, especially those who innovate and may not fit into standard clinics, which is my bias, and the needs for stable, connected, trustworthy care of those in our community who are often very hidden and silent, who find it difficult to trust people, to believe they're worth caring for and to access help. 
I will now introduce Angela to explain more about the person-centered care program at Brisbane South PHN. Thanks so much, Johanna. So I will now take you through um, our person-centered care program at Brisbane South PHN. Um, it's been my pleasure to manage our person centre care program, and this is a program we are truly proud of and see a lot of great value in through working with general practice teams and supporting them to deliver person centred care. We're really helping to improve the health and well-being of our community. We know that healthcare system is complex and can result in fragmented service delivery, and we also know that it's still dominated by the biomedical model. And this often means that people's experience um, falls short of their expectations. So through our person-centered care program, we're helping to shift that focus. Our program focuses on acknowledging and welcoming people as active contributors to their health and well-being, and creating a holistic and connected system focused on what matters most for patients. Our person-centered care program focuses on helping practices to develop an understanding of what person-centered care is and being able to support them through the associated changes. And this of course can only be achieved by building the capability of our own staff to be able to support the practice in their journey. So we have, as you can see, some big overarching objectives for the program, but it's really about bringing all of the theory that Paresh has explained and putting it into practical activities that practices can implement to change and be more person-centered. The program was designed with GPs and with subject matter experts with the goal of being able to support practices at any stage to make incremental changes towards a more person-centered care delivery model. And the fact that working on these person-centered care initiatives helps practices to meet their accreditation and PIPQI requirements means that it's even more valuable and relevant to general practices. And although we've designed the content for the program specifically for general practices, the content really has a wider applicability to other environments. We launched our person-centered care program in 2018, and it's been a bit of a journey. So in our first year, we had 18 practices sign up to the program, and this was run as a really structured and supported six-month six um, program of education and coaching sessions on specific change concepts. So in the following year, we launched our person-centered care toolkit. And this allowed for more practices to be able to access the resources without having commit to commit to the whole structured six month program of coaching. Um, so this meant that people could read through content, read the modules and pick out activities that were relevant to their practice. Um, and of course our, hand, our team was on hand to be able to support them with assistance. In 2020, we had planned again for a face-to-face delivery of the content. However, COVID of course came and changed all of that. So we ran the program virtually with online workshops and um, workbooks with the practices. Um, we recorded all of those workshops and they are still available online um, for free for others to review. So in 2021, we'd planned again for a face-to-face -face, um, program, but unfortunately that was foiled again by COVID. Um, so this time the virtual program that we ran was really a series of recorded webinars that were open to anybody to participate in. And we also had targeted coaching for specific practices that um, expressed an interest. Um, and you've just heard from Johanna, who was one of those participants. Last year, the aim for the program was really to drive meaningful use and adoption of the existing content and resources, and particularly engage GPs. Um, to make data-driven improvements. So we aligned the program with the changes to the continuous professional development for GPs and highlighted how analyzing your data and making person-centered improvements can contribute to the reviewing performance and monitoring outcome requirement for CPD. So we had over 30 GPs attend the initial workshop. However, what we found was that many were unable to make the commitment into a coaching series. So what does our program involve? Well, the main resources that we have are the online person-centered care toolkit and with 
recorded webinars and practical activities and templates. We also have um, an online readiness tool, which is known as the PCCPA, which I'll discuss in a minute. And we have a practice planning template to help practices get started. All of this is supported by um, our team with further support linked to digital health, as well as quality improvement um, and practice development, such as the Practice Nurse Support Program. So a good starting point for practices who wish to undertake a person-centered care journey is our PCCPA, our Person-Centered Care Practice Assessment. And this is a validated 12-question online survey tool, and it's based on the Patient-Centered Medical Home Assessment Tool. Um, it's been designed to help general practice teams to assess the current state of their practice um, as a first step for then identifying any areas for improvement. Then we have our Person-Centered Care Toolkit. This toolkit consists of self-paced online modules and each covers a different patient-centered medical home change concept. So the activities are really practical and designed to support practices to provide higher performing healthcare through a range of quality improvement focused activities. The module content addresses specific concerns for um, groups of individuals that may face barriers to access or disproportionate um, health outcomes. It's designed to be interactive, so people don't need to do every activity and they don't need to complete them in order. Um, practice can just do the activities and the bits that suit them when they need it. So these are all our toolkit modules. There is an introductory module which gives an overview of person-centered care and there's a practice planning template to help practices get started. Then we have our foundation um, modules, which is the quality improvement approach and engaged leadership. So together, these modules form a platform for scaffolding other person-centered care improvements on. Although none of the modules are mandatory, um, we do recommend completing the quality improvement approach and engaged leadership first, as it helps set teams up for success. So adopting a quality improvement approach is really important for being able to make person-centered improvements. We have adopted the model for improvement, which uses, which uses the plan, do, study, act cycles. So this is about collecting data as you go and measuring change through feedback loops to be able to tweak any improvements as required. And practices are supported to identify what data is important to collect and how to use that data to drive improvement or know if what they're doing is an improvement. And we also encourage practices to collect and analyze patient feedback or experience measures as part of this process. The engaged leadership module relates to how the leadership and culture of the practice um, will help to support and sustain positive change and improve quality. Throughout this foundational change concept, teams are really encouraged to look beyond the direct patient care and build the practices, values and team culture to be more person-centered. It's about creating a shared vision and a shared purpose through understanding and aligning people's internal motivations. Um, it's important to listen and involve all team members of all the different um, working groups in the practice and the happy and engaged team um, will provide better care. So we've had some um, lovely testimonials from practice participants who have been through our person-centered care program about the multitude of benefits that they've gained from participating in the program with us. Um, and this really goes back to the beginning of the webinar where Parash talked about the value of person-centered care. By putting people at the center of their care, we're creating value at all levels of the healthcare system and for all stakeholders. It's not been an easy journey. Um, sometimes we have struggled to get engagement um, and particularly throughout COVID where um, it really threw a spanner in the works and General practice had many competing priorities, um, but we have been able to start to build a culture of person-centered care. 
Um, and we're starting to have practices reach out again, wanting support now that we're starting to move past COVID. So far, we've had 98 completions of our person-centered um, toolkit, and we have had our, the skill of our coaches recognized nationally. We've been able to provide over 74% of our general practices with quality improvement support in the last 12 months. <clears throat> So what have we learned throughout the program? Well, no two practices are the same and it's really important to meet practices where they are in the journey. And um, it's about eating the elephant one bite at a time. So the toolkit is really designed to be built upon um, and the philosophy is built on that continuous quality improvement approach. We also find by linking the work to accreditation and PIPQI, we do get better buy-in from general practice as well. The readiness assessment can be a really useful first step um, in helping to build the team and a shared understanding of what they want to work on. We found that face-to-face -face delivery is much better. Um, it was difficult to get engagement during the virtual sessions. Um, people were a bit more reluctant to share. Um, and also we didn't get as good feedback on those sessions. Um, we also found that being a, a lot more people would register for the events and not um, be able to attend them. So we definitely will be looking for face-to-face -face engagement in future. Um, we have found it's difficult to engage GPs, but by using GPs in the program and having a peer-to-peer -peer coaching and also aligning it to CPD, um, that can be quite a good motivator. Definitely a whole team approach works best. Um, it can't be left to just one person to try and implement these changes on their own. The two foundation modules of engaged leadership and a quality improvement approach definitely help to set the scene and build the team. And when the team trusts each other and the process, then great things can happen. So hand in hand with the person-centered care program is our general practice quality improvement team. So this team offers a range of support for general practice um, and they go out and provide on-site coaching to support the practices in their change journey. So as part of this person-centered care practice program, we've invested in the continuous development of our coaching team as well to be able to facilitate the program. They've conducted over 590 coaching sessions in the previous financial year, and this was across 157 general practices. We have over 30 quality improvement toolkits on our website. Um, each of these is on a different topic. Um, these have been accessed from our website over 16,000 times. So what is next for our person-centered care program? Well, we are excited to have just launched our new interactive tool, which is designed to help practices identify what areas for improvement they'd like to work on. Um, so just by answering a couple of questions, they'll be directed to um, content or resources and activities based on their needs. We have a wealth of information and activities that have been developed from previous phases of the program. So we're really aiming to help people to be able to self-direct and select the appropriate information to guide their journey. And we plan to resume face-to-face -face delivery again to help continue building general practice team capability to embrace person-centered care. So our person-centered care toolkit and the associated resources are available free from our online learning platform called Discover PHN. So for anyone interested in accessing that toolkit, you can go to discoverphn.com.au to request a free account. And the platform also houses a wide range of resources, including um, previous webinar recordings and learning modules on a range of other topics, such as health literacy and cultural safety. You can also find out more about our person-centered care and quality improvement programs by visiting our Brisbane South PHN website. So although we're focused on general practice, our program resources are applicable for a wide range of primary care teams. And, um, we would love to hear from you also. So if you'd like to get in contact, please email us at support at bsphn.org.au. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Angela. And um, I would like to introduce our panelists um, from the Brisbane um, South PHN team. Um, and also joining us um, who wasn't in the presentation is Nicole Forrester, who is the Quality Improvement Coordinator at Brisbane South PHN. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we've got a few questions coming through. Um, first of all, though, um, Johanna, um, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, and thank you for, for, for sharing your story. Um, it was a really interesting to um, hear how that played out um, personally as, as well as um, clinically. Um, in your practice, you're, you're obviously able to spend quite a lot of time getting to know and understand your patients. Um, I'm interested to know, um, does that align with the Brisbane South um, PHN model for, for that sort of delivery of care? And, um, and if not, what, what sort of um, structural approaches do you, do you think would support this and enable GPs to continue this sort of service? Um, I, I was thinking this through and I think the key thing is that what Brisbane South PHN are putting forward is not so much a model but a sort of personalised framework that they can go into each practice and work with that practice about um, how to bring that framework into their own uh, sort of space. Um, in, in my case, I think what's happened with the PHN is that um, because of their value of equity, um, they have seen my work and wanted to make sure that any designing they do going forward um, would um, not leave out the patients that I've been caring for in their community. So um, my patients, uh, I would say um, some of the assumptions around capacity to advocate for yourself that can be part of um, frameworks that uh, are more streamlined or structured um, uh, they, we need, I guess I, I would summarize that we need GPs who are there to, who've also sort of fallen through the cracks of the systematizing of this work and creating team-based things in order to care for those who fall through the, who will fall through the cracks of these more organized setups. Um, and I can see that, uh, you know, person-centered care to me is actually at the heart of good quality general practice. Um, and I would compare that to biomedical or reductionist things that are focused on disease. And so that person-centered, uh, you know, finding the practitioners who already do that work and then supporting them, I think, is a way forward in this space. Um, and I would see that the work uh, that has been done at a more systematic level is trying to ensure that that heart of general practice goes through into, into when it's organized in teams that are more structured and more supported and funded that way. Uh, I would say that um, in my um, journey, I've had to actually let go of potential funding streams in order to look after this caseload. Uh, so I was never uh, um, uh, eligible for PIP payments, for example. And um, I did this, put this coaching process without any benefit to my, um, my clinic. Um, just because I, I had a passion in the area. So I guess I would be advocating for looking after the practitioner, which is one of those five values of, of this person-centered work, um, the practitioner caring as well as the patient and seeing that both of those groups of people need to be looked after in our healthcare community uh, for it to flourish. Thanks. Um, and, and that um, leads me on to, um, to this next question. Um, so um, in engaged leadership seemed to be key and it's the first building block in, in the model of high performing primary healthcare. Um, Paresh, are there ways to in engage leadership um, and especially in, in the topic of person-centered care? Yeah, <clears throat> Thank, thanks Anna for the question. It's absolutely a, a fundamental and critical su success factor for this sort of initiative. I think when we're thinking about leadership, it really starts with, um, and I think Angela kind of mentioned this, it really starts with uh, creating a shared purpose and a shared vision. And, and so I think supporting leaders, coaching leaders around look, looking at uh, the, the importance of a person-centered approach, uh, I, I think that, that that's where it starts. Um, I think taking a coaching approach is really helpful. I think that engaged leadership, um, so this, this isn't a sort of lone ranger approach, it's a team approach. So everyone in the practice needs to be 
involved. And so coaching that engaged leadership around uh, a, a more sort of adaptive leadership approach, a more distributed sort of leadership approach, influencing and bringing the rest of the practice team on is, is very much part of the, 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 the way to do this, I think. Um, you know, in in um, my kind of experience of doing this with Prison South PHN and, and others, um, it very much comes down to, you know, when, when you speak to clinicians and you speak about person-centered care, it resonates with most clinicians because when we go back to why did we enter health in the first place, um, there's, there's an emotional connection with it. The problem I think is over time, training, the pressures of the system, all start to get in the way and, and we lose that connection with our true purpose around why many of us went into health. And so often it's just igniting and reconnecting people to that purpose and then giving them the skills to, to look at how to do that with other members of their team. Um, and I think that's kind of where, where the art and success lies. Thanks. And we've got a comment saying it's, it's great to see GPs engaging in, in this um, topic of patient-centred care. Um, Angela or Nicole, um, is, is it, do you get a lot of GPs that um, join the, the programme? Um, or um, uh, um, one of the questions is asking if you get any occupational therapists. What, what's the sort of mix of clinicians that, that um, join? I'm happy. Um, so, so far it's mostly been with general practice teams. So it's often GPs or practice managers who register their practice for the program. Um, when we do go out there and work with those teams and we, we work with them to kind of create that shared understanding across the team of what it is that they want to achieve. Um, we do also look at if they've got a certain goal that they're trying to achieve from a quality improvement approach, taking that whole person-centered care approach and considering from a multidisciplinary team perspective, are there other um, allied health that they need to be connecting with to do that wraparound care? So that sort of forms all of that quality improvement approach when we work with those general practices and they're doing that theory of change towards the goal that they've got. So um, I don't know, Angela, if you had anything you wanted to add um, to that in terms of the question. No, I think you've answered that really well is that we do try and involve the whole team in the process. And um, so do you involve consumers in the design of the program as well? And do you, do you have a process to get feedback from consumers through the actual practices to, to um, improve the program? So we, are, so as Mike said in the opening, the PHN is not involved in direct service provision. So we work with the providers, which is the general practice teams to um, work better with their consumers. Um, we don't directly get that feedback, but the practices certainly do. And so we will get anecdotal feedback um, okay. on patient stories. Um, Nicole, you probably hear this a bit more than I do about some of the feedback that we get from consumers. Yeah, and I think you touched on it, Angela, in your presentation as well. Um, when we work with practice teams about um, building their quality improvement team, what we're trying to do as well, which is part of that person-centered care approach, is starting to get them thinking about, it's great to have representation of the different roles across their practice team. So having a, a GP, a nurse, a um, admin member on it, but we're also starting to get them to think about inviting a consumer from their patient population to be a voice on that internal quality improvement team as well so that consumers have that kind of direct input into any kind of goals or quality improvement activities that they're doing around patient population health so um it it, it is a journey um and there's different maturity across practices so it, it's something that we're in that early stage of planning those seeds with it um but we always work with practices as well when they're testing their change ideas and using those plan do study act cycles to refine them. We're often encouraging to collect that consumer feedback um, and work closely with their consumers and their patient population to understand how that change and what their feedback was on that and refine it in response to that. So that's great. 
Um, and Angela, you, you mentioned the accreditation to PIP requirements and that the programme can help meet um, some, some of those. Um, for our audience that are less familiar um, with um, accreditation in primary care, are you able to um, explain a little bit about, about what that means? Sure. Um, so as part of um, general practice accreditation with the RACGP, one of the core modules is around quality improvement. So that has different things, um, criterion in it. So it um, looks at reviewing practice data, their processes, structures and systems um, to make co continuous quality improvements. So by participating in the person-centred care program and doing the model for improvement on whatever they decide they want to work on, it helps them to meet that accreditation requirement and provides the evidence um, that they've been doing those continuous quality improvement, um, that continuous quality improvement work within their practice. Um, the PIP is a practice incentive program and one of the programs is looking at quality improvement in general practice as well. So it's really about being able to deliver best care to people. Um, and again, participating in our program uh, helps them to show the evidence. Um, this requirement for the PIP is to be able to participate in continuous quality improvement. And so this meets that requirement for them. Um, and they really get coached through that process by our team as well. Excellent. Nicole, do you have any actual examples of quality improvements? You, you touched on it with the consumer feedback, but do, do you have any um, actual examples of, of what a quality improvement might look like? Might look like. Um, yeah, so um, I can talk about when I was working as a coach specifically for the person-centred care programs, it was sort of in that 2020 um, iteration of the program. Um, and the practices involved in the person-centred care program at that time were encouraged to choose a topic to focus a quality improvement project on that might span six to eight months. So um, one of those um, I can use there was a practice that chose they realized in the area that they had really low rates for um, screening of breast cancer. And they had a couple of GPs that had um, a significant interest in the area, but they also had a population um, that was quite um, culturally and linguistically diverse as well. So we worked with that team to have a look um, at their data to help them kind of understand um, what was what the data was actually showing them. Um, and then we supported that team to build a quality improvement team within their practice um, to establish a goal. So they wanted to see over a six month period an improvement in um, the participation in breast cancer screening rates. Um, and what they started to do was use some of those quality improvement tools with our coaches. So driver diagrams to understand the theory of change. Um, and for example, one of the ideas that they tested over that period of time was they looked at what their referral process was for um, identifying and referring patients to um, Breast Screen Queensland. And so they used Plan Do Study Act cycles um, to test the idea of embedding a referral template into their software um, and tested that rapidly, but they did it on very um, you know, small scale. So they would test it with a handful of consumers, get feedback from those consumers, they reflect as a team as well how that actually went, refine it as they needed until that process of having a referral process for it embedded in the medical director became um, part of their business as usual. Um, so that was one of their ideas, but over the six months, they they tested quite a few ideas. They trialed a point of care um, system. They also trialed a, um, I think one of the things they wanted to look at was do a community evening um, with some um with some peer representation for the patients to understand as well about the risks um, with breast cancer. So there was a few things they tried over it and they actually um, exceeded their goal. They did really well, um, but that's... That's great, that's great. And, and, and while we're, we're sort of looking at measurements um, and quality improvement, Johanna, do, do you want to um, tell us how the uh, measurement framework that you, you brought in in your practice? Yes, yeah, so I um, found a really um, helpful tool that I found to be more useful than some of the routine outcome measures that we're advised to use here, like the K10, for example, which is um, looks at mood mostly um, from the from the UK called Continuous Outcome Routine Evaluation, and it had in it some things that helped me pick up 
on my trauma patients, such as I have been struggling with unwanted memories or images as one of its items. Uh, and it had some things around attachment. So the quality of connection to other people. So I could assess loneliness and um, those, those kinds of things, as well as assessing risk around self-harm and suicide. Um, and so I instigated doing that as initial meeting and then every six appointments after that to just monitor progress. Uh, and then later on in my time, when I was working with some psychologists, I adopted a tool they often use to assess the quality of the relationship between the patient and the clinician um, at, around trust and, um, you know, whether they, they felt safe and comfortable with the clinician uh, and instigated that uh, at, at regular points uh, through the time that they are with me. Um, so I found those very helpful. And there was a third part to the continuous outcomes, which was they would um, outline three goals and um, then reassess how those goals had been met through the therapy and give feedback on whether they uh, wanted to add any more goals or uh, and how satisfied they were with the therapist's um, um, work. So uh, that um, then gave me direct feedback from the patients about um, the process with them. Uh, and of course, always watching for the outcomes around simple little things like um, how comfortable they felt in the waiting room and, um, you know, whether they felt um, more connected to their children, more capable to handle day to day decision making. Um, and of course, the big ones like um, not going to hospital, not needing to go to hospital anymore and um, having somewhere safe to talk about their worries. So those are the sorts of things I would be monitoring. Thanks. Um, Paresh, I'm going to bring you in here because um, it's probably it's a bit more of an opinion based response, I think. Um, we've got two separate questions um, looking at um, whether this program would work in a hospital environment and whether it would work across an aged care facility, which I think are, are really interesting questions. Um, yeah, and in interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Anna. So the way I would describe the program essentially or at least you know the toolkit it, it, it's really a capability building program so the the, the toolkit um, and the online modules uh, Angela talks about what that does is it provides knowledge and then provides some tools with some examples of how that can be applied the coaching component of it then allows that adaptation to the context of the participants. Um, and, and certainly, you know, I think when, when I, when I think about the, the content that's there, the tools that are there, um, and, and then a coaching sort of mindset, which allows adaptation, there's certainly no reason why it can't be applied to different contexts. I'll take the aged care as an example, because clinically I do a lot of aged care work. Um, you know, look after, as a practice, we look after something like 600 residents across 20 plus residential aged care facilities in the ACT. And we've used this approach and the same change concepts around thinking about it. Um, but the metrics, the indicators, the measures become different. So it's hard to measure, for example, you know, diabetes in the same way you might in a routine general practice because it's so much more personalized in an older population. So we've actually evolved to using patient reported measures and we've mapped, you know, them, them across to the iChum frameworks. So we measure things like loneliness, emotional well-being, physical well-being as the indicators. So it's really adapting and selecting measures and indicators appropriate to the context and the population or the subpopulation we're looking at. And, and then the change concepts applied to try and deliver in, in that direction. Um, the, the slight hesitation I have when I think about the hospital setting, I'm kind of going to differentiate hospital to specialist. So there's no reason why it can't be used in that sort of specialist ambulatory type of setting, whether we're thinking about outpatients or specialist practices. Um, and certainly a lot of the evidence where this comes from um, is particularly the US. And so that patient-centered medical home model, um, where it's got its origins, you know, actually started life in, in pediatrics, for example, in, 
specialist pediatric practice. So I think in ambulatory care delivery models, it can certainly be applied. I think when we're looking at that acute focus of a hospital, I think uh, certainly aspects of it can be applied, um, but it probably needs a slightly different reframe to apply it in its entirety. It's because this is more about longitudinal care, it's more about ongoing care rather than very much about episodic care, which is what that acute care is about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you mentioned the coaching there. Um, we had, we've got a couple of questions about the coaching. Is there a particular methodology the program uses? So um, I, I may go and then Angela and Nicole, please feel free to, um, and, and Joanna as well. So the 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 this is John Whitmore's Grow model is the model we've kind of used, um, and we're working with sort of AgPal in this, and um, and so that Grow model uh, really talks about well the G's for uh, goals, uh, the R's for reality, uh, the O's for options, and the W's for way forward. So it's really having coaching conversations, which bring in all those elements. We adapted that model to put TH in it. So it's the growth model. The, the TH are for tactics and habits. So it's really about creating some sustainability and having some actionable things people can do and then keep doing them in the form of habits. So it becomes a way of working. It becomes business as usual. Cool. Did anyone else want to step in on that one? No, <laughs> no, that was perfect. I was going to say the growth model, which is we did train the trainer with um, subject matter experts like Paresh that took us through using that growth model with um practicing. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And I think it's um important to note here that um the toolkit is available, um, isn't it, to the to the general well general public or people <laughs> practices that might want to use it. Um, from your website. So we'll provide links to that as well in our next newsletter. Um, and I had a question, are, are there other PHNs using the same model that you know of, or is this unique to Brisbane South? No, no okay. one wanting to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, you know, we, in, in various hats I wear, do work with other PHNs. And there are uh, certainly elements of this sort of work being used in other, other PHNs. The way it's packaged, the way it's wrapped up may be different, um, but, but there are certainly um, elements uh, of, of this sort of work um, happening in other PHNs. I would say, in, in my observation, the Brisbane South PHN approach has been uh, quite comprehensive and it's been sort of end-to-end -end with building the tools, uh, providing the tools uh, in the form of a digital platform and then supporting it through a, a, a coaching and translation program. A um, number of PHNs that I've observed doing that sort of comprehensiveness is probably quite limited and, and probably a handful across the country. Um, but, you know, this, if, if you look at elements of it, that's probably more broad across um, a number of PHNs, yeah. I think um, part of it is, you know, as Mike said at the beginning, the um, aim of the PHN is to really improve health outcomes across our regions. So one of the core components of our um, service delivery is that working with our providers to try and build that capability for continuous quality improvement. That's great, thank you. Um, look, we've come to the end of our time, which is a shame because there's a few more questions um, in there that um, I had an interest in your answers as well. But um, we'll we'll try and filter these through um, the next newsletter that that we put out. Um, but I'd really like to thank um, Brisbane South PHN um, and their partners in this work. So Paresh and Johanna, thank you very much. Um, it's a really good presentation and discussion today. Um, and for everyone that's watching or listening. Um, please continue the discussion. Um, you can join our person-centered care network um, and we hope to have the next newsletter out by November. So please keep sending us all your ideas and initiatives because we'd love to keep sharing them with everybody else. And we hope you've enjoyed this series of webinars. We, we certainly have. And um, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. <laughs>